Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that can save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org, in partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Since November 14th is World Diabetes Day, we're focusing today's show on one of the most prevalent complications, amputation. Every 20 seconds globally, a limb is amputated due to diabetes. Why? Extra sugar in the blood can damage the artery walls, allowing for fats and cholesterol to sneak in and push that artery wall out, hindering blood flow to the feet. Sometimes the first sign a diabetic has is restricted of this restricted blood flow in the leg arteries, known as peripheral artery disease or PAD, is when an ulcer appears on their foot or toe that just won't heal. Every 1.2 seconds somewhere in the world is a new diabetic foot ulcer that appears on someone. Diabetic foot ulcers are responsible for more hospitalizations than any other complication of diabetes, driving direct costs of at least $40 billion annually worldwide and at least $17.5 billion in the U.S. alone. Now, today we're going to be talking about innovation around the treatment of diabetic ulcers, and I know there are different reasons for them. And the story of a patient in the second half of the show we're going to share, he and his wife, um, they're using a new technology to try to help heal and prevent further amputation as well. Today we have quite the crowd with us today, Dr. Phillips. We have Dr. John Alper, a podiatrist. We also have... Um, our nurse practitioner, Kay Smith. We have Dr. Dr. Jason Hamp, the podiatry specialist in South Miami, Florida, who has 34 years of experience in the medical field. And he's also uh, the, a boot designer for the Foot Defender Boot, and which is for people with diabetic ulcers. Also, Michael DiTullo, hopefully I pronounced that right. He's a former shoe developer at Nike, who also developed shoes for Shaq. Everyone knows Shaquille O'Neal. And he is also um, a boot designer for the Foot Defender. So we're going to get more into that innovation in a moment and introduce you to all of them and let them say hello. But I think we have a moment of inspiration, Dr. Phillips. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular, vascular moment of inspiration. (laughs) Kim, how are you? Um, Happy Happy Saturday. Uh, it's great to be oh, yeah, on I'm, happy Saturday. I'm, I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking all of that. I'm looking forward to the show. It's I'm in Columbus. Uh, it's snowing actually. So uh, I like that. The, the times have changed. And uh, like with any season in life, uh, you know, this too shall pass. And, and my uh, thoughts of information center around uh, Tom Hanks. So Tom Hanks has uh, type two diabetes. I was kind of looking uh, looking oh, at yeah. famous people with diabetes, type one and type two diabetes, and um, you know I, I ran across Tom Tom Hanks, and he was at a round table talking to some uh, coll- uh, fellow actors about you know his thoughts on life, and you know if he if he could go back in time and talk to a younger Tom Hanks, what would he say? And he was kind of focusing on this notion of this too shall pass. And, um, you know, having time be your ally. And, and I think that's that's pretty poignant. Um, at the end of the day, uh, if you're feeling pretty good, that that's going to pass. If you're feeling pretty lousy, that's going to pass as well. So, yeah. so just let let time be your ally and um, just wait it out. Uh, things usually get better or they declare themselves. And, and uh, so, you know, my thought for the day is this too shall pass like the snow in Columbus here. Wow, I, I, I can see Dr. Hampt over there just kind of nodding a little bit. And when it comes to diabetic ulcers, yeah, you know, this too shall pass. It'll either get better or it get, it'll get worse. <laughs> That's right. It either goes one way or the other, frankly. One way or the other. I actually think it's the opposite in diabetic foot ulcers. I think most of the complications we're seeing are because we're waiting so long to intervene and provide appropriate therapy. So sooner rather than later is the way to go with diabetic ones. Yeah. Totally agree. I think nurse practitioner Kay would agree as well. Yeah, definitely would agree. Um, some of the diabetic foot ulcers I've dealt with over the years have been horrendous, and a lot of them have led to needless amputation. I think you might. Well, I, I know I mentioned it in. Go ahead, Michael. I was, was going to say I think Jason and I like to say uh, 
it will pass if you use the foot defender to pass a little bit quicker, more quickly. So that's that's kind of our, our whole goal today. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get into it, you might as well tell everybody what the foot defender is just before we get started. <laughs> we'll work backwards here. Michael, do you want to take that? Or do you want me to take it? I, I think you should take it, Jason. It's your it's your baby. <laughs> So I, I am the inventor of the foot defender, so I'm a little biased, but the foot defender is a culmination of 35 years of experience, biomechanical engineering and shoe design. I am not a designer, so as you introduced me, but I am the inventor. Michael is the designer. Um, a foot def- the foot defender is an offloading protective ambulatory device that was built from the ground up to take the pressure off the bottom of the foot. Um, there isn't another device on the market that was built from the ground up for such a such a process. And uh, the vast majority of diabetic foot wounds that lead to amputation are the ones on the walking surface of the foot. If you don't limit the pressure of walking, the wound cannot heal, regardless of the vascular status. Even well vascularized wounds won't heal with the pressure of walking. Um, and the, so the foot defender is a device that looks essentially like a basketball shoe but functions like a removable cast. Um, so it's a, there's over 100 pieces within the device, 13 granted patents and 26 pending patents uh, on wow. this ambulatory protective boot. And I, I love uh, working on, on challenges. And you know, I've worked on, I've probably brought four or 500 shoes to market uh, over my wow. career, um, many for Olympic athletes. And so, you know, working on this with Jason was just, you know, it, was, it was such a, a tough uh, puzzle to solve, and, and uh, I'm really proud of the work we've done here. Why was it so tough? It's a lot of conflicting parameters. Um, you know, I, I think of like uh, designing a piece of footwear is like pushing around the sliders on, on an equalizer, and you turn one thing up, and it, it comes at the expense of something else. And wow. this this is the longest product I've ever worked on in development. It took us four years uh, working for an, wow. four and a half uh, years working together. And Jason had been working on it for se- several years prior. Um, but just to get um, it to function properly, to dissipate pressure um, properly, reliably, easily was so difficult. Cause we also, we not only wanted it to solve the problem of dissipating pressure, but we wanted it to be easy to take on and put off. Just like, uh, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you have to go to the bathroom, I, I want it to go on in, in 15 seconds, not 15 minutes, you know. And so balancing all those things was difficult. Yeah. Was there a moment where you actually thought that you had it, but then you thought, oh, no, Many. the drawing board. Oh, really? 30, 39 iterations with Michael. Yeah. No. There were many oh, times where we were like, this is going to be the one. And there are other times where, you know, the, the whole the whole front of the product is removable. And I thought that was going to be a real challenge. It was kind of just an insight. I was like, why don't we just make the whole front come off? And uh, the engineer we were working with at the time was like, that'll never work. And that part worked like try one. But, you know, I, that's always the way product development. The things you think are going to be hard end up being easier. The things you think are going to be easy end up being the, the challenge that challenges that plague you. Well, coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, you're going to then find out why they needed to put in this time and effort on this boot. So stay with us. Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including cardiovascular system's Diamondback 360 atherectomy system, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. 
For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, please, if you want to call in, our number is 1-888-367-5329. And we're continuing our conversation about diabetes and, um, you know, the aftermath of sometimes poorly controlled diabetes with respect to ulcers that uh, involve the foot uh, and can lead to minor and major amputations. David, uh, let me let me ask you here. So when you see a patient that you think has a diabetic ulcer, um, because not all diabetic ulcers are actually related to, you know, poor blood flow. How, what what goes on in your mind? Like, all right, how am I going to get this person to heal this? And and then kind of if you can fold into offloading options uh, like like uh, Michael and Jason were talking to with respect to their defender foot. Sorry about that. The key phrase here is offloading, because. You've got two things going on. You have potential circulatory issues on the inside, which is more your bailiwick than mine. But you also have pressure. You have rubbing. You have friction. And especially if you're dealing with someone with diabetes with diabetic neuropathy, where they don't feel that. You know, if you have a pebble in your shoe and you're walking around, you're going to go over to the side, take your shoe off, get that pebble out of there, and you're not going to cause any real problems. It's difficult for people to appreciate, but diabetic neuropathy truly removes the ability to feel and thereby removes the ability to have knowledge that there's excessive pressure, excessive friction, excessive rubbing. The tissue can only withstand so much. And that's not even taken into account any type of deformities you have, bunions, hammer toes, anything that may be sticking out. And then, of course, a shoe that just doesn't fit properly. Combining all these things with activity of a chronic rubbing the tissue breaks down. Now, when someone yeah. without PAD, without diabetes, you may develop a blister. You'll notice it. It'll hurt. You'll throw away that shoe, hopefully. Put a Band-Aid on it. You should be fine. But with somebody that can't feel it and somebody that's not able to heal easily, that chronic rubbing is going to b- cause breakdown layer by layer by layer of that tissue. And wow. then you come into the circulatory wow. issue where the building products that help the tissue rebuild are just not getting there. But if you, so, if you can't offload that foot, meaning reduce the pressure that it feels when you're walking, uh, you know, if, if I give it better blood flow, I, I still feel like it's a little bit of a losing battle. So aside from the foot defender, are there other opportunities out there for patients to offload? Or is that, you know, the only way you, you can approach this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've been offloading, you know, and and I think Jason and Michael are taking it to the next generation, but we've been doing things to offload feet my 36 years of practice and somebody taught it to me. So, you know, probably Lincoln had it, had it offloaded. (laughs) Um, But it's the compliance, right? Well, Well, compliance comes into it, but, you know, we as podiatrists and orthotists, people that make and design inserts for shoes, that can take pressure off a particular area. Again, if you have a deformity, if you're walking more on the inside of your foot, bearing more pressure under the ball of the foot, if you have a bony prominence on the side of the foot that's sticking out. Of course, if shoes don't fit properly, if you have rigid shoes, you know, wearing cowboy boots or high heels, you know, made me a lot of money, but doesn't do a whole lot of good for people that have foot problems. So the offloading question, John, is really more of a matter of trying to redistribute the weight. And you can do that, you know, with something as sometimes as simple as quarter inch felt or an appropriate insert in a shoe made with a good shock absorbing material like plastizote. These are things you can get from a podiatrist very easily. I mean, this is one of the things that we do. There are also uh, technicians called orthotists. Usually they work in conjunction with podiatrists. Occasionally they are freestanding. But once again, they'll take a mold of the foot, they'll take the shoe, and they will do what they can with the insert in the shoe and appropriate fitting shoe to get the pressure off of that. Having said all of that, that's kind of phase two. Phase one is making sure that the circulation gets there. And then, of course, the appropriate uh, treatment for that wound, which could be something as simple as antibiotic cream or enzymatic creams 
or, or the honey application. Sometimes we have to go into skin grafts, you know, skin substitutes. I mean, these are the wondrous things that we have nowadays. Um, I could take it back to 1985, where, believe it or not, we used to mix betadine and sugar together and make a paste. Oh, wow. I can take you further back than that. Egg white and, <laughs> and oxygen. And you've heard of Maalox that people drink for, for ulcers of your stomach. We used to make dressings out of Maalox. So, yeah. oh, but oh you know, Kim, that was the standard of care because that's what you had back then. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so to answer your question, John, real at the end of the point is you have to reduce activity while the wound is there. You know, you're yep. not taking your 10,000 steps every day while this one, and I know it's contrary to what Kim and the weight of my heart has been pushing and pushing about getting people walking to grow collaterals, not while you're healing a wound. Right. The foot care, the shell itself, the proper fit of the shell and the style of the shoe is important. And then it's a question of offloading, um, gaking that pressure off that hot spot. It does occasionally, I will add one final quick thing. It does occasionally involve bony surgery. You know, where sometimes you have a bony prominence, you know, a metatarsal head, the, the long bones of the foot, or, you know, a toe that is rigidly cocked up, you want to straighten out. Obviously not the first thing you're going to do, but more often as a preventative measure, you sometimes have to intervene. And that, again, is where a good podiatric surgeon will come into play. And I think Dr. So, so David and John, I want to I want to take that from you. Um there are over 400 different offloading devices currently available in the United States for offloading diabetic foot ulcers. That being said, the average wound healing time for a vascularized diabetic foot ulcer in the United States, there's a 34% chance you're going to heal that wound in 20 weeks, 20 weeks, over 100 days. So of all those hundreds of devices, something is wrong. Number one, yeah. most of them don't work. Shoes of any type do not take enough pressure off a diabetic wound to allow it to heal. Number two, which is why we built our company, is most of the devices out there, patients physically can't use. So imagine if I, you came into my clinic and I told you, here's a boot. I know you can't use it. And there's a 34% chance we're going to heal this wound in 100 days. Is there any other branch of medicine where you go to the doctor and they tell you, you got a 34% ch chance of healing this? So yeah. that's why we built our company. We are building devices that off actually physically offload the foot. They may not be the most comfortable. They may not be the most appropriate looking. I would say they're way better than what's on the market, but they are effective at reducing the force on the bottom of the foot. Right now, 85% of the wounds treated in this country, a first world country, leave the facility they're treated in, in the same shoe they came in in, possibly the shoe that caused their wound. Wow. So even though all of the literature says contact casting is without a doubt the best at offloading, it's a fantastic device. 2% of the world uses casts on patients who need it. So there's 98% of the patients who are leaving wound centers in inappropriate offloading devices. But it's also a problem is that they just don't want to wear something that looks funny, that, that draws attention to it. And so... Massive stigma, massive stigma. That was the number two thing we found when we polled patients. 82% of them said, the devices you're giving me place a stigma on me. When I go to work, when I go out yeah. in the world, people know something's wrong with me. And that's why we brought Michael into our company so we could design products that look more socially appropriate and help lift the stigma of medical devices. You know, it's my, my goal was I wanted to go from people, you know, someone wearing a boot and, and another person looking and being like, oh, what's that? I wanted that person to say to go, oh, what is that? You know, could we create something that was actually cool that people could wear to work or the grocery store and, and wear a Nike or a Jordan on the other foot and just feel like it was normal? And, and I think when you, when not only does the foot defender work, but if you put a pair of jeans on and you put the cuff of your jean on over this and it feels much more like a sneaker visually to other bystanders. Actually, you know, the bottom looks like I was watching a couple um, NBA games the other night and it actually the bottom and the, the lower part of it looks like an NBA player's shoe. Yeah, that's, you know, we're exactly. using a lot of sneaker technology and construction techniques on the outside, even though inside this thing, there's a, a sprung piece of carbon fiber in the forefoot here. There's a completely molded uh, three dimensional, basically brace that goes all the way around the back half. You can't see any of that. It doesn't look like a science project. It's textile 
it's it's leather it's rubber it's it's, it's common shoe materials on the, on the exterior well coming up right here on the heart of innovation we'll have a patient story someone who's trying to heal his wounds so stay with us Three years ago, my symptoms started with leg pain and leg cramps while walking. Me too, with a tightness in my calves. Well, do you know, my doctor thought that my leg cramps were a side effect of the statin he prescribed me. Well, my doctor just brushed them off as another symptom of old age. Mine thought the pain was radiating from my spine. My doctor blamed my neuropathy on diabetes until I got a wound on my foot that just wouldn't heal. Yeah, it turns out we all have peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. It's plaque buildup mainly in the leg arteries causing poor circulation. For me, the diagnosis came too late and I lost my leg, but that does not have to happen to you. No, it does not because there are treatment options available if you're diagnosed early enough. PAD peripheral artery disease. If you've been experiencing leg pain, leg cramps, or neuropathy when walking, and your doctor isn't hearing you, we are. We are the way to my heart, the largest support network for peripheral artery disease patients. And we want to help you get back on your feet again. Visit our website at thewaytomyheart.org or call our Legsaver hotline 415-320-7138. Your life and limb could depend on it. Save by piggies. Your life, your limb, your story with interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips, and Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas. Well, that, you know, Aikman, thanks so much for putting that little soundbite together. Uh, we clearly now have a little definition between our conversation and then, you know, the Save My Piggies uh, segments. And and today, uh, really happy to have two guests on, uh, Derek and his wife, Tony. So the Save My Piggies, as you all know, it's it's allowing the patient to kind of tell their, their, their medical story. Uh, and in this case, Derek has had some uh, diabetic ulcers and, and uh, unfortunately has had some some minor amputations and kind of on the heels, no pun intended, of us having conversation about offloading and and, uh, you know, appropriate uh, footwear. Um, we wanted to have Derek and, and Tony on and, and, and have yeah. them share their story with us. So, Tony, are, are you with you. us? Yeah. Hi, we have, we have, yep. There's Tony. We have Derek, who's who's here. Don't, Derek, say hello. So we know your voice. Hey. Hi, Derek. Can you hear me? There yeah, yep. there we, we go. Also, Hi, we also have Dr. <laughs> K, Dr. David Alper, Dr. Jason Hampt, and we have uh, Mike DiTullio, who is the designer of the Foot Defender, and uh, Dr. Hampt is the inventor of the Foot Defender, which is a, a boot designed to help people with their, um, to heal their diabetic ulcers. But I, as Dr. Phillips said, we're going to get into um, that's right. I just wanted to introduce all the different voices you may hear. <laughs> yes, that's right. We have we do have a large group today, so this is awesome. So let's get let's get right into the meat of the matter here. Uh, Derek and Tony, why don't you tell us about your vascular journey? Um, you know, from kind of how you ultimately figured out that you had an ulcer from diabetes, perf- you know, blood flow issues, and and and, and kind of where it started, and and share that with us, please. All right, I guess I'll start. Um, well, it started with a toe on my right foot. I I didn't feel a sore on the toe. Um, and it just immediately just started turning to chronic, and I, I had to get it cut off. I didn't know I had any vascular problems until we got a hold of Kim. And uh, she sent us to yeah. Dr. Mustafa. I really didn't put uh, the having the diabetes with having artery problems. I never knew that, you know, and, and none of my original doctors never said anything about that either. So yeah. it's been, you know, cut a toe here, cut a toe there. And now I've ultimately been up to a transmetatarsal amputation. So meaning you've lost all, all the toes on that foot. So oh, this really, yeah. you know, I'd like to get the input real quick from our, our two podiatrists part of what we're trying to do with way to my heart and save my piggies is, is raise awareness. And it just doesn't register to patients that an all, you know, a change in color of the toe or some wound 
is just not normal. And, and that can lead to catastrophic events and, and potentially, you know, major amputation, loss of a leg. What is it that you two, you guys do in your practices to try to ra- raise awareness uh, to, to this, you know, devastating disease process? We'll start by taking off your shoes and socks and looking. You know, people all too often, you know, as you get older, your feet get farther away, so you don't look as much down there. You know, Derek's <laughs> first statement, I didn't know that there was a problem down there because he didn't feel it. He is yeah. blessed to have Tony that's looking down there for him. Yeah. A lot of people don't have a Tony, but you have a mirror, you have friends, you have family. But part of every single day when diabetes enters your life should be looking at your feet, making sure your doctor looks at your feet. You know, you go to the doctor and you put on the silly gown and they tell you to leave your socks on because it's cold. You know, it's all about looking and awareness, John, and it's all about reacting. You know, a red area is not normal. You know, a streak is not normal. And rather than saying, you know, as we were talking about at the beginning, this too shall pass, you know, unfortunately, a red area means the toe should pass. And that's where it comes in. Uh, you know, the statistic that we keep hanging on is over 85% of, of amputations from diabetes are preventable. That's a shocking number. And it's all about early and often. Jason, I'll pass the ball over to you from there. Visualization is key. Um, and if you don't have a significant other to do it, a uh, mirror on a stick works pretty darn well. It's really high tech. There are an inordinate number of technologies out there, though, that can help you. We have digital cameras. We have pressure and temperature sensing mats you can put by the bedside. But Dave's point is exactly right, John. Uh, looking at the foot and something that wasn't there yesterday and is there today needs to be inspected by a professional. It, it, real quick, though, I mean, I feel like have we failed our patients in, in this process you, you diagnose somebody with diabetes oftentimes a primary care physician sometimes you go into an endocrinologist are we just not educating them well enough as to what are the complications of diabetes and again we're talking 40 billion dollars uh, with respect to vascular complications and 20 billion in, you know worldwide 20 billion in the u.s so it's not a small chunk of change and the lives that are lost and you know derek i want you to tell us too now that you are missing all your toes uh, it's harder to walk, right? But at least you have your foot. So, where, where do, how do we change this? Because you know, Jason, you talked, you you talked about in the previous segment, we're gonna offload them right away with the, with this with this boot. But you know, moving forward, being proactive, how how do we how do we change the direction of where this is going? So my thought is, it's not a physician or a patient failure, but a systemic failure of our delivery system. Until our medical payment system pays for preventative care identification of risk. Right now, a doctor can't get paid for examining a patient and saying, oh, look, you do have diabetes and you may have neuropathy and blood flow problems. There's no code for the possibility of peripheral neuropathy or peripheral vascular disease. So until we have preventative measures that are reimbursable, patients will get treated when they have a problem, not before they have a problem. Basically, medical care is reactive, not proactive, John. Yep. That is just the way the system is set up. The other thing, too, is that we do need to get our patients to have some type of bonding with a medical person. More and more and more, it's the ancillary because physicians do not have time anymore. And when you go to the doctor, they want to deal with your acute problem. But the PA in the office, the NP in the office, a diabetic nurse educator, if they're fortunate enough to have one, these are the ones who can get the message across as well. It's everybody knows you got to go to the eye doctor every year if you have diabetes, which, by the way, to Jason's point, is covered. You should be hearing the same thing about a podiatrist. You enter the world of diabetes. You need a podiatrist in your life, someone that knows what they're looking at. And then it's a matter of them reacting accordingly. And finally, finally, and this is something the American Diabetes Association is pushing as well too. People with diabetes have to own their disease. Some of the responsibility has got to go back to the patient. They have to take it themselves. So if they've got shoes that are just not appropriate, if they're not looking at their feet, if they're saying, well, 
I hopefully this will just go away. There isn't a thing in the world that a doctor can do. So some of this does come back to the patient as far as owning this disease, but it's also a matter of making sure that this communication continues. And right. coming up right here on this segment with Save My Piggies, we're going to hear more from Tony and Derek and their reaction to what the doctors have said. So stay with us. Medical Notepad brought to you by The Way to My Heart in partnership with Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Have you got a wood back on? Well, I'm Kim Smith, nurse practitioner with The Way to My Heart, and I'm here with today's medical notepad. A wound vac is actually known as topical negative wound pressure. It creates a suction on the base of your wound. If you remember back to when we were a teenager, and that takes me a little while, it'll probably take you just as long, and you got a love bite on your neck or a hickey or whatever it's called. Basically, they sucked on your neck and they brought the blood to the surface. And what a wound vacuum or topical negative pressure does is it sucks on the base of the wound and it actually draws the blood back into the wound. And in doing so, allows granulation to occur. And that heals your wound three times faster than any other known medical therapy for healing wounds. Now, it comes in two different forms. It can come in a foam, which is black, and it can also come in a gauze bandage, which would be soaked prior to application. I myself prefer the, the, the gauze, but a lot of doctors prefer the foam. It just depends where the wound is, because I find if there's any tunneling or any underneath in the wound, the gauze is actually better to place into those areas. Over the top of it, there'll be a medical drape and the medical drape is to keep create the vacuum. If you find that it's annoying your skin and you're having blisters or red marks when it's taken off, there are plenty skin protectants on the market that you can actually get from CVS and they're extremely cheap to buy. Or ask your family doctor if he could write you a prescription for them. Um, most are alcohol based, but there are water based skin protectors available too. So there is always a solution to any problem with a wound vacuum. Some patients feel a slight pulling sensation when the vac is switched on. That will ease off gradually. Now, the vac is mostly used on wounds that have a depth to them, but they can also be used on surgical incisions, which makes sure that the dressing goes on top and makes sure no infection can penetrate the wound for seven days. And that tiny little vacuum will stay on for seven days. I'm Kay Smith, nurse practitioner with Way to My Heart, with today's medical notepad. Medical notepad is brought to you by The Way to My Heart, in partnership with Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Remember that the advice and views offered are for educational and informational purposes only. Do not act on any information provided here without the explicit consent of your own healthcare team. For more PAD education, go to standagainstamputation.com. And for real-time support, go to thewaytomyheart.org. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. We're continuing our Save My Piggy segment. And again, we're really pleased to have Derek and Tony on, uh, as well as our other guests uh, discussing diabetic uh, wounds. Uh, so, Tony and, and Derek, we, we were kind of pivoted a little bit uh, with respect to your story. But, Derek, you were telling us that you ended up losing all, all your toes at, at one point. So mm -hmm. how are you doing right now and, and where, where do things stand? Well, it's, um, you know, I still have a uh, slight open wound. Uh, it's taken a while to heal up. Um, I think what the deal was is that uh, previously I had a, a portion of the bottom of my foot was cut. That was like five years ago. Then the top portion, I didn't have a whole lot of meat for them to do a complete uh, flap on the cut. So they just did a guillotine and, it, and it's healing kind of funny because they didn't really sew it up all that great. But um, I, other than that, I'm, I mean, I'm doing fine. I mean, 
I do the two step every now and then that that's no biggie, but, um, as for getting around, I, I'm okay. And, um, you know, this boot really does help a lot. I, it's a lot better than anything you get from a, a hospital. Um, cause this, you know, and I, me personally, I don't care what the boot looks like, you know, I'll, I'll wear it. You know, it's just, it's not the looks and everything aren't, don't bother me at all. The ones you get from the hospitals are no good. And, um, this one here, it fits good. It's comfortable. Um, I like how the, the whole front of it comes off and it's soft. You know, I mean, it's, it's rigid in there, but it is soft. And then, um, you know, the ones you get from the hospital, just all hard plastic. It takes forever to put on. You got straps, you got to pull on this one here with the Velcro. You just basically just slap it on, air it up and go. So and Tony, it, oh, sorry, Derek. So Tony, I, I wanted okay. to get, get your thoughts. Like you, you've been obviously with him kind of shoulder to shoulder dealing with these wounds. Um, what are, what are some of the, we, cause we've been talking about patient education and, and kind of raising awareness what, how have you changed with respect to your approach to, to taking care of his wounds and then obviously looking, making sure nothing develops on the other side as well? Well, I think uh, to Dr. Alper's point, which I got to say, Dr. Alper, you're just phenomenal. Everything that you've said has been the truth. And not only on this episode, but other episodes where you talk about lanolin mm-hmm. and the things that you need to take care of to mm-hmm. take care of the wounds. I think really following a nutritional plan, really educating yourself and thank God for Kim and Kay from the way to my heart, because through their resources and really dealing with the fact of taking care of your diet, making sure that you're keeping uh, clean wound pads and really monitoring the situation and really Derek's adherence to it. Because when we when I think of Derek, I mean, Derek was a railroader. He was a very blue. He's a very blue collar meat and potatoes kind of guy. So for him to like change his whole life, to stop smoking, to really adhere to a program of eating right most of the time and then (laughs) having, you know, having (laughs) having um, um, things available to us through the way to my heart, we feel very blessed to have this boot and we feel very lucky to have you, Dr. John, and and the whole show basically teaching us that, you know what, we have more power than we realize. And and Dr. Alper, you're 100% right. It comes down to the patient really oh. adhering to a program, adhering to a, a, a healthy way of eating, exercising, and just implementing everything that you have to do, having a good podiatrist, having a good, um, if, if you do get an infection, having an infectious disease um, doctor, but more importantly, really just making sure that you don't miss appointments and you do everything that, that you're, you're, you know to do to help heal. So, but this is something that's gone on so much longer And and why is that, Tony and Derek? I mean, there are so many gaps that you have, um, you know, experienced in healthcare that I had before the show talked Mm -hmm. about with Dr. Hampton and Dr. Alper that some of what you've experienced has been what even they have said has been below the standard of care, which is you didn't get the revascularization of his foot prior to amputation. Mm -hmm. You're not getting the foot checked, you know, at every single appointment. So, yeah, Tim, I'm I mean, going to jump in on that. And, Tony, if you, let me throw something at you. It is vitally important to embrace the idea of second opinions, especially when someone's coming at you with an aggressive treatment. There is nothing, nothing insulting about asking for a second opinion. And if a physician is insulted, you want to do that, I would run from that physician because that second opinion is either going to validate what they're thinking or giving you a, a better or a different approach. And patients are all too often, I don't want to insult my doctor. You know what? It's not insulting. So, Kim, to your point, that's where I think one of the gaps came through here is that Tony and Derek will put on the conveyor belt without a chance to really jump off and see what else they were walking by. 
And I want to bring up one. That's a very good point, doctor. And I, I want to bring up another point. When Derek first got this, uh, this uh, black um, uh, gangrenous area on his skin, um, people need to know that once you get an ulcer, it is a, it's a speeding train. It's not something where you get this little ulcer and then all of a sudden the doctor is able to manage that. No, those ulcers turn into one and two, and then it turns into the other foot. And it is a, it is a speeding train. It goes very quickly. And if you don't hurry up and get with a good podiatrist and get with a good team and have an advocacy program with, with, uh, the way to my heart and somebody really making sure that you're educated right away that's where you're starting to see the amputations just going much quicker because you don't have anybody behind you and mm. educating you and you're relying on yourself who is not a doctor on that note that very good point we're gonna head to break save my piggies we'll be right back Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Rapid fire, this is our last segment. We've got about four minutes left. We wanna hear from all of our guests real, real quickly. Uh, Kay, final thoughts. Look after the slightest hint, as Dr. Alper says, of an ulcer. Deal with it immediately. Make sure you've got a team behind you and make sure those feet are looked after from start to finish. And something like this boot, sorry, I've never worn trainers, but it looks absolutely amazing. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. David. Look and react. Simple as that. Every day, look down there. Have somebody that loves you very much to look down there and react. Fantastic. Jason, uh, final thoughts again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. So one of our mantras, one of our words of action is we want people to start treating diabetic foot ulcers as a end stage disease, not the beginning of a problem, but as the expression of the entire diabetic system failure, the vascular compromise, the offloading not working, and the metabolic process of the patient failing. So you can't just put them in a boot and expect them to heal. They have to have blood supply, they have to have offloading, they have to have infection management, and most importantly, they have to have metabolic management. Their blood sugar has to be under control, and they have to have enough proteins and branch change amino acids to heal the wound in their system. So the wound isn't a warning sign. The wound is a, we've reached the end of the road. You better fix me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's that, yeah, that is a great point. It is it is end game because these folks are on a razor's edge. Uh, Michael, what uh, what what do you guys have in store for uh, for people coming up with uh, you know new new shoe technology and stuff? Yeah, uh, Jason uh, mentioned that we have some some footwear coming as well. I mean, we're almost seeing the the foot defender is almost like our F one car where we're we're testing out a lot of technology. We're proving it out, uh, and then we're going to cascade that down into a, a series of shoes. We have a product called the Cloud9 that has this, all the same technology inside as the Foot Defender, but in just a nice slip-on shoe that you can wear after the Foot Defender or maybe before you get to that point where you need that. Um, I, I love think that. that. It looks almost like you, a rubber. Yeah, yeah. Can you make us one of – remember that shoe that they had in uh, Back to the Future that kind of like yeah. wraps itself? Can you make us one of those? Yep. That thing was awesome. Um, so we actually looked at licensing the auto-lacing system from Back <laughs> to the Future, so you're not far off. Um, But patients told us what they wanted was a device they could wear at home. They take their shoes off and when they come home. So that's where the cloud nine comes in, where we can actually protect them at home. I I just wanted to add one other thing. Jason uh, mentioned real hit hit on real quick that a lot of these boots that we're selling are going direct to consumers. And that I think we're going to see that in the medical industry in general, people are going to become more active buying products directly. And with that, their expectations are going to get much higher, right? Because they're not going to be comparing this to other medical products. They're going to be comparing it to the experience they have. Well, you know, iPhone (laughs) on on that, on that same line, you know, I I'm seeing commercials, I think for evidently it's, it's a, you kind of stick it to your triceps area and that gives you blood glucose readings. And so you're exactly continuous glucose monitors. Yeah. 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 Amazing. 
Kim, how well, are we thanks doing? Thanks everyone for joining us. Yeah, I know this is amazing. Just remember, revascularization is really key. Get that blood flow. Make sure you have enough blood flow to help those wounds heal as well. But this has been an amazing discussion. Would love to have you guys back at some point. I, I think that we've just um, touched on it and there's so much more that we could be talking about. So we really appreciate you time, your time and how you're innovating to help so many um, critical need patients around the world. Great show. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Stay well and healthy and have a good holiday, everyone. Yeah. been listening to The Heart of Innovation with Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Our mission is to help patients live a better quality of life through comprehensive education, real-time support, and high-touch advocacy in partnership with thewaytomyheart.org and take a stand against amputation. Our purpose is to reduce the 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes and nearly 200,000 amputations annually. For more information regarding topics you've heard discussed on today's program, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. The Heart of Innovation is for educational and informational purposes only, and advice and views shared are not a substitute for medical advice from your own supervising physician. Do not act on any information provided in this show without the explicit consent from your own healthcare team. If you think you are having a medical emergency, call your local emergency number or go to the nearest hospital or emergency room.